Good morning. Well, how's everyone this fine day? Hope you're doing well. And let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, praise you and thank you so much, Lord, for this day and for all that you do for us and that uh, things go well for everyone who's listening today and for everyone that uh, we can find someone uh, new uh, that is searching for you, Lord, and you can put them in our path so we can help them to find you uh, and to uh, point them in the right direction and give us this joy and help us uh, to learn your scripture and to study it every day. And help me, Lord, to uh, teach this uh, particular subject that we're, we're working on and here in Ezekiel. And you get, sing the Holy Spirit to help us out. And in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. I've been listening to uh, uh, the more I, uh, I think about how close we are getting to that day when uh, the Lord will return to take home his church. And I think it's so, and uh, you know, I can't say if it's today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, uh, or 10 years from now. Uh, there's just there's no time frame. But uh, as we watch world events, it just seems like, uh, I love the saying that, uh, uh, particularly this time of the year, you know, we're starting to see it already. Uh, we're in October, and we're seeing uh, Christmas gifts starting to be put out. Uh, the stores are getting ready for the Christmas holiday. We got all the different Christmas trees that, uh, and all the decorations starting to be put out in the stores. And I'm sure the manufacturers are working hard to get toys on the shelves and uh, get all that stuff ready for the Christmas season. And we know that Christmas is uh, coming, but that uh, if we can see the things happening for Christmas, then we know for sure that uh, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. And that's kind of how we look at uh, the, uh, the tribulation. All kinds of signs to tribulate, many, many signs. Uh, I think there's over a hundred uh, just of the second coming of Jesus, besides all the things happening to the Jewish nation. But that uh, there's no signs at all for rapture. Uh, it can happen at any time. Paul thought it could happen in his time frame. So there's no reason that, that the rapture has to wait for anything. It can happen at any second. Whenever the Lord decides that uh, he's going to bring us home and then he'll bring us home. So uh, probably our biggest mandate these days is to reach as many as possible since it looks like Christmas is really close. And it, uh, who knows how close Thanksgiving is uh, on the prophetic timeline when it comes to the rapture. So uh, finishing up chapter 44, I just got a few more verses I didn't get to yesterday. I was getting a little late. I'm trying to, trying to stay in around a half hour. Uh, and I still had uh, oh, 15 or 20 verses to finish up this part of the chapter. And then we're going to get into, I named this Inheritance of the Land of Israel Foretold. We're going to start getting into it just a tad bit here in the end of uh, chapter 44. But we're going hot and heavy into it in chapter 45. So I'll try to get to a few verses and a little opening statement on uh, chapter 45. And what the land of Israel is going to look like. So let's uh, get in there and... Uh, I'll bring my same picture back that I had before. And let me change a few controls here. So we have verses. And I'll get my other one, the bigger one for the bigger, for the longer verses. Okay, get that one working. And we left off in chapter 44, verse 26. And after he is cleansed, they shall reckon unto him seven days. And what we're finishing up here is that, again, the, the priest and the, and the whole process of uh, going in and ministering to the Lord, uh, that they had to be uh, both spiritually and, and physically clean. And that under Jewish law, that uh, that required them to uh, bathe, to be dressed uh, a certain way. Uh, their clothes had to be certain types of clothes. Uh, kind of like, you know, uh, kind of like think of it that... Uh, I kind of like to put a tie, a nice tie and a shirt on when I go to, go to worship the Lord at, the, at church. Uh, there's no law that says I have to, but I think it's important to put our, you know, we're going to see the master of the universe. We're going to uh, worship the creator of the universe. Uh, no different than that. You're going for a job interview. You know, you're uh, most likely you're not going to go in jeans and a t-shirt or shorts and a, and, uh, and a, and a white t-shirt. You're going to put something nice on. You're going to go into the office and hopefully get the job. 
well, I think we should be this, feel the same way about uh, going to the Lord. And so I try to put a nice shirt on and a tie to go to church. I won't say I always have, but uh, that's just my take on it. And, uh, and, then, and then the priests are doing the same thing. Whenever they go into minutes of the Lord, they put their best foot forward. They put their nicest clothes on. They make sure that they're clean. They don't smell. But on a Jewish law, that also required them not to come in contact with anything that had been dead, uh, and that the human or animal. And so uh, what we're thinking up here is that, uh, that the, the sacrifices themselves were done by people who were, were not going to go into the temple itself, and that the uh, blood and ashes, the, the product of that, uh, would be ta taken into the, uh, into the temple uh, to the Lord. And in this case, being the Millennium Temple, it seems that we're, we're also serving the Lord his, uh, with these foods uh, and that uh, they're cooking enough of them that that's also going to be enough for the priests and the other people working in the temple area. So I guess I'm going to go into uh, uh, numbers a little bit that uh, talks about uh, more, more about the seven days and why uh, you had to be, uh, you couldn't come in contact with certain things for seven days. So Numbers 19, 13 through 19. Whosoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. He is unclean is yet upon him. This is the law when a man dieth in a tent. All that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel with have no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for the unclean person, they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin and running water shall be put therein in a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were done there and upon him that touches the bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at evening. So those are the rules of uh, coming in contact with anything that was dead. And I think there was probably a really good backstory to this is that, uh, of course, germs grow quickly on anything that's dead. And I think that this whole process was to make sure that uh, that you cleaned yourself and it, it put emphasis on making sure that you were clean uh, of this and that you didn't come in contact with other people during the time frame and pass on those uh, that bacteria and stuff. I think that's probably the basis behind it. But again, in the Millennium Temples, it's all as a memorial to what their forefathers went through. Okay, Ezekiel 44, 27. And the day that he goeth into the sanctuary unto the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance, and he shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. Now we're going to get into a little bit more talking about uh, the, the inheritance. And in this case, the inheritance of the Levites or the temple priests is Jesus himself. And it was more it was like symbolic that their sole purpose is to take care of the Lord. Uh, they, they don't uh, do any uh, field work. They don't uh, graze any crops. And that they uh, all, their, all their time is spent uh, in uh, taking care of the Lord in the temple area which includes people that come there to worship also. And so that uh, there was a requirement that anything that, uh, that the temple priest would be taken care of financially by, else, by, the other, by the other folks outside the temple area. And so we're going to get into that just a little bit. Over here in Numbers uh, 1820. And the Lord spoke unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in the land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. So again, this, this original mandate was to Aaron back in Numbers by Moses that he was going to be the uh, the, chief priest, uh, the high priest. <clears throat> there was always a high priest. And a high priest is someone who is 
kind of in charge of all the priests of the temple. And in this case, Aaron, and Aaron became the first high priest and, and so that every single priest after him had to be a descendant of his. Also in Deuteronomy 18, one and two, I'm sorry, nine, uh, first nine, Deuteronomy 10, nine. Where am I? Yeah. Wherefore Levi have no part nor inheritance with his brother, the Lord is his inheritance, according as it, accordingly as the Lord thy God promised him. Also in Deuteronomy 18, 1 and 2. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. So part of their uh, benefit is that anything that's presented uh, as an offering, uh, the meat and the and all the other stuff, the leftovers of it are uh, belong to the uh, to the uh, priests. Therefore, shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, and as He hath said unto them. So again, this started all the way back with Moses, and it will continue into the millennial kingdom. And Joshua also makes um, note of this over in thirteen fourteen. Only unto the tribe of Levi he gave non inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them. So back to Ezekiel 45, 4. Uh, this is going, going back to <clears throat> earlier, talking about possessions. And the holy portion of the land shall be for the priests, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to the minister unto the Lord, and it shall be a place for their houses and a holy place for their sanctuary. And this is what we're going to get into here uh, coming up uh, here in a minute, chapter 45, when it talks to, because the Millennium Temple is slightly different uh, than the original, is that they do have some land assigned to them uh, where they can raise their families and have houses. Back to 44, 29. They shall eat the meat offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering, and every delicate thing in Israel shall be theirs. This is also uh, mentioned over in Leviticus 27, 28. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man, oh, that's my place, both of a man and beast and of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the law, Lord. Okay, verse 30. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. He shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. So this is like a tithe, uh, this dough. Uh, it's actually a type of food. Uh, and he, over in Numbers 15, 20. Actually, I got it. No, I got it. Uh, over in Exodus 13, 2 first. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whosoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. This is talking about first fruits. And number 313, because all the firstborn are mine, for on that the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, mine shall they be, I am the Lord. <clears throat> this has to do with uh, temple. Uh, in other words, uh, the firstborn of every household had a responsibility to be, to be given to the Lord for uh, temple work. And we saw this in uh, a good example. This is Samuel. Uh, if you remember back to the uh, uh, the whole story of when Samuel was born, that uh, his mother Hannah had prayed uh, for a, uh, I think it was Samuel, that Hannah had prayed for a uh, son. Uh, I probably won't be able to find it real quick. But I think I'm remembering it correctly. Samuel had to be, uh, that Hannah had prayed to God for a son, for a son, and he, she promised to give him to the court when he was weaned uh, to the king. And I think I can find it real quick. I think I'm thinking of the right person. But now that I said it, I better at least check. Mm -hmm. Oh. 
Yeah, so it's in uh, uh, Judges one eleven. Judges one eleven. Judges one eleven. First Samuel one eleven. Makes sense. That's Samuel is about Samuel. <laughs> Where's Samuel one eleven? Yeah, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on my affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thee thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and that there will be no razor come upon his head. This is the uh, Nazarite uh, vow. Uh, and that Eli was the high priest at that time. Now, Hannah. Uh, so I end up, uh, so I'm pretty sure it's Samuel. I'm not sure it is. Yeah, there it is. Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Daniel. Yep, I had the right person. That would have bothered me if I would have not verified it. But that was a good example of the uh, uh, Navarite vow. Uh, and it, uh, this is basically what this verse is saying, that uh, uh, the firstborn. But in this particular case, there was, a, there was a, a Nazarite, and it wasn't necessarily every firstborn. I think it's more of a dedication that you're going to raise the child in the admiration of the Lord, and they'll be available for uh, uh, temple service. Okay, number 1520. And this is what I'm talking about the dough. You shall offer up a cake of the first of your dough for a heave offering. As you do the heave offering of the flash thrashing floor, so shall you heave it. And so that's what, that's what dough means. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically bread. Ezekiel 4431. The priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or corn, whether it be a fowl or beef. So basically, uh, no roadkill for the uh, for the uh, priest. Uh, and it, uh, if it dies, uh, like if it dies at a natural death rather than being uh, killed, then it uh, uh, it should be eaten. It's usually when something dies of its own accord, it probably has some kind of something wrong with it, and you wouldn't want to eat it. This is also mentioned on Leviticus twenty two eight. That which dieth of itself is corn with or is corn with beasts. It shall not uh, eat to defile himself. Therefore, I am the Lord. And also in Deuteronomy fourteen twenty one, he shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it. For thou mayest sell it unto an alien. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. So. That is a uh, the uh, end of chapter uh, 44, and basically uh, we can see that the parallel of the verses are are so much exactly like uh, what uh, <clears throat> uh, was written in the original uh, Leviticus ruling uh, under Moses. So when it comes to the day-to-day -day operation, the two major differences is the, is the type of uh, temple uh, and the fact that the Lord himself is going to be there, uh, ruling and reigning the planet. Because <clears throat> even in Moses' time, the Lord was there, but it was, the, the, the planet wasn't being ruled by, uh, by him. Uh, he hadn't, uh, had, uh, and man was of his own device, and there was good, good kings and bad kings, but uh, quite a world history going back when you think about all the different countries of the world. 
Uh, back then, God was only really dealing with Israel uh, and not the entire world. Of course, he cared about the entire world. <clears throat> I think God's original, original plan, really, uh, even though he knew it wasn't going to happen, was that he was going to basically teach. That's, what, that's what's happening here. Is that, uh, this is basically a school. Uh, and the Lord is teaching this, uh, these priests and these Levites to go out and teach the people. And the, the, the people are going to go out and teach the entire world. So that's where I can see us being involved is that uh, the teaching part. Uh, besides ruling these different areas uh, where the people start to uh, multiply. So let's switch the picture a little bit here. And we're going to jump into chapter 45. And it looks like I'm going to have to take the bigger picture. And let me change the picture. And now we're going to get into something kind of cool. Let's see which picture I want. Five, I think it was. Not that one. Five. Yeah, this one. This picture here, let me get this out of the way for a minute. Now, if you remember, if, you remember, uh, if you've been around the Bible for a while, <clears throat> maybe I should have got a picture of uh, Israel today just to kind of uh, show you that uh, this is what Israel is supposed to look like according to the original uh, uh Original land that was given to Israel by God uh, and Moses and, Mo and Abraham's time frame. And of course, they haven't had that much land at all, ever. And so, uh, I don't see that I have a picture. Oh, there's one. Okay, and basically, uh, Israel right now is, okay, this is Lebanon up here. So Israel is basically here, uh, over to here. They do have uh, this area up through here. Over here is Syria. I'm sorry, no, that's not Syria. That's uh, us, so this is an old map. I'm kind of basically comes down the uh, this is the uh, <clears throat> can't think of the name of the river now uh, Jordan River and it comes down the Jordan River that's the Galilee area where Jesus did a lot of his ministry and they do have some land on the other side of the Jordan over here and they come down through here Jerusalem is right there and uh, here's the Dead Sea. And at the end of Judea uh, comes in this area. And then, of course, this red area is uh, uh, the Gaza Strip. Now, this one's showing uh, some of the old countries, but that's my map I can grab right now. But that's what uh, God originally promised them, uh, was basically it did encompass all of all the way up to past uh, Syria, all the way to the Euphrates River. Okay, and down to uh, you can get to the, you can get to the dimensions. Uh, I think it's in Genesis, and then all the way over to the uh, river of uh, which would be the Nile. It's over here. That was supposed to be the land, because you remember Abraham started in the Ur of the Chaldeans. That's this area here. And that he basically, when he left here, God said that uh, you get uh, every footstep uh, that you follow will be your land, uh, will be my land that I'm giving you, given to the Jewish nation. And basically, Abraham originally started walking, heading up through Babylon, uh, through the, uh, up, up beside the Euphrates River. And the way this is designed is actually a mountain range kind of through here. So the only way to really get to this part of uh, Jerusalem is to come back down uh, from the north. That's why you hear so much about uh, the north. 
because even when Babylon took over, uh, they actually traveled from here and gone up, uh, maybe not quite that high, more, more like over here. And then they came down and took over Jerusalem. So this is the area, and each one of these little strips is the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it starts off Dan and Asher. And I spent the day, part of the day uh, today coloring a uh, picture to make it look a little bit easier to see. Here's what I uh, ended up with. My attempt, it was all white. And so I was trying to make it a little easier to see, but basically uh, this is the same area, just a little bit uh, smaller, maybe easier to see, I'm not sure. You got basically Dan up top and then Asher and Naphtali and the two sons of uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Messiah and Ephraim, and then Reuben, and then Judea, Judea uh, being uh, <clears throat> the one that uh, has Nazareth in it, and one that our Lord was born out of. <clears throat> this is the area we're going to start talking about today, is the the, uh, the area around <clears throat> Jerusalem, but it's going to be a lot different in the Millennial Kingdom. Then Benjamin, and then si uh, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulon, and Gad. And so that uh, includes all 12 of the tribes of Israel. No, I said just 13 there. Because really uh, the Levites uh, get to get a portion this time and it's this little portion here. So I'm going to get, get another picture that blows up this area right here, which is what we're going to be talking about first. That one is right here. Okay, and this is, this is a... There's a couple of different pictures. If you go searching for a picture of uh, this area, uh, you'll find a couple of different ones. And, and there's a few that don't make any sense whatsoever because of the sizes. And uh, there's one verse uh, that we'll hear. I think it's one of the first verses we'll look at. And we're probably not going to get very far today, but some of them a half hour. But uh, this area here, uh, you see the square right here, is talked about in a verse. And it says 25,000 uh, across and 25,000 uh, down is this area and it's square and there's three sections. There's a section for the Levites. This is what I painted orange. There's a section for the priests. And so this would be the priest area. And this little gold thing in the middle is the temple. And there's a section for uh, to put the city itself and some areas beside the city for growing crops and stuff. So this is Jerusalem. Now, uh, right away, you already see one big difference is that uh, the temple is no longer in Jerusalem. And this is where the controversy begins because when you look at the sizes they're talking about, it's impossible to put the temple that they're talking about in Jerusalem the way it is. And we also know that at some point that, that uh, uh, and this is still not fully clear in my mind how it's going to happen, uh, but we know that uh, even after the uh, uh, Millennium Kingdom, that there's still going to be a temple because it says forever. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation. I and mean, you know that uh, during uh, Monday's uh, thing that if you watched it, you watched my little uh, idea on uh, the uh, where we're going to be living during this time frame. And uh, hard to say whether I'm going to be right or not, but either way, that one comes out to be 1,500 miles square. And that wouldn't even fit if you use the entire portion of Israel. If you think about 1,500 miles uh, in, in the United States, the United States is about 5,000 miles wide. And it's like, uh, I think it's like 2,200 miles uh, high. And so it would fit inside the United States, but it would take up most of the United States, uh, the Millennium Kingdom city. So that, ain't, that one ain't going to fit in Jerusalem either, uh, the new Jerusalem. I mean. So where that's going to be is kind of hard to say at this point. But it is fairly easy to see that uh, based on scripts that we're going to be reading, and I'll try to point everything out, that the temple will be located actually north of the city because it needs more real estate. Now, the other thing to realize, too, is that <clears throat> it also states that uh, during when Jesus returns and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, that it's going to split in two. 
And that's how it's able to have these rivers that go back and forth uh, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. <clears throat> so this is the this is the best, it seems like the most logical way to look at it. <clears throat> and so we'll get more at the end of this. It's already been a half hour, and rather than <clears throat> start reading any verses, uh, just give you some food for thought, and we'll dig into this next week. And so uh, on that note, I hope you have a great weekend, and we'll end with a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time we get to look into your word. And thank you, Lord, for the, the promises you uh, have made. And Lord, at, uh, we find it really uh, kind of a, I love being the, the, the treasure hunter, Lord. Uh, and thank you so much for all these little neat details you give us, just enough to, uh, to really make us wonder what you have in mind for your new Jerusalem and in the, in the, in the, in the temple. And we look forward to seeing what you actually, what actually comes about, but that uh, uh, really enjoy trying to uh, see what you're thinking about and what you're planning for this period of time. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So I will uh, talk to you again uh, in a, uh, uh, on Monday, and I will probably see some of you in church on Sunday. So have a great weekend, and if I don't see you, uh, talk to you again Monday. God bless.